Hi Chem students, I want to go through very methodically one of these method of initial rates problems and uh, I'm throwing in all the bells and whistles here on this problem so you can see uh, pretty much the hardest it could become. Uh, so let's start by looking at it. Uh, we've got this problem where there's some data for a reaction and it says it's catalyzed. Uh, we'll see what that means in a second. But uh, the reaction's 2A plus this substance B2 creates this A2B2. Now this is a, a bulk reaction because you have not been told it's an elementary reaction. It's either, it, it's only going to be elementary if I tell you or if it's in a mechanism. So this is not in a mechanism and also someone's doing all this experimentation on it, it's probably going to be a, um, a bulk reaction. So that being said, it's, it, it says it's catalyzed. Uh, we can identify the catalyst then right away. It's got to be this substance R-12. And I gave it this stupid name because oftentimes chemicals are given these trade names that are kind of ridiculous. And uh, it doesn't matter what it's called. It's still just a chemical that's part of this uh, whole process. And our goal is to try to figure out what are the conditions that alter the rate at which this process occurs in terms of concentration. So our, our, our pathway is going to be very simple. First thing we're going to do is first we're going to write we're going to write the, uh, the, the, the generic rate law. And uh, you need to do this so that people know what your little symbols mean. This is just communication 101. And let's go ahead and do that because it's so straightforward. In our rate law, we always write rate is equal to, and then we write our rate constant. Uh, so the only thing left is to put all of our species that might affect the rate into here. So the first one is A, and we'll give it some kind of power, X could use any symbol you want there. And then we'll put B2 here. And we'll put Y. And then catalysts can be in the rate law. So let's put that in here with a little Z. All right, so we've got the first step done. Yay, check mark on that. What's the next thing we need to do? Well, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to find each order of reaction. And to do this, we look for, uh, we look in the data for uh, trials where only one uh, species changes concentration. So we do that because if that species changes concentration and the rate changes, we know why the rate changed. The reason for the rate change was we changed that particular thing's concentration. And that will then allow us to connect the change to its power, that, this, these little orders of reaction. And when that's finally finished, when we get our rate law, then we can solve for K, the rate constant. We do that by using any trial. Now, if this was a real system and we were doing stuff, we would collect uh, we would calculate K for every single one of these and then take the average. That would be the better value. So this is our plan. This is what we're going to do on this method of initial rates problem. And we've already got step one done, but it's because it's very easy. So I'm going to erase real quick and uh, be right back. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here and scroll up. We've got a generic rate law. Our goal then would be to find all of these guys X, Y, and Z. Let's go ahead and try to find one of them right now. Let's go ahead and do, let's, let's find this X. And X is related to A. So we want to find X and it's related to the concentration of A. And therefore we need to find a, we need to find a, a situation where A changes and everything else stays the same. You know, therefore, A changes, but B2 and R-1, 2, do not. That's what we're looking for over here in our trials, in our trials. So if I look around, I can find this one fairly quickly and I made it simple this way. But if I look at trials three and four, if you take a look, B is the same, R-1, 2 is the same. And because of that, this change in concentration caused a change in the rate. So we can use this little algorithm that I, that I showed you in class or in another video. And that is x is equal to the natural log 
of the ratio of the rates, and this would be trial 4 divided by trial 5, divided by another natural log ratio of the concentrations. The concentration of A at trial 4, the concentration of A at trial 5. So all we really need to do, if we're smart, is plug in our numbers. I'm going to move this over so we can play with this a little bit more. All we have to do is plug in our numbers, and I'll clean that up. So all we do is go in and uh, we can say the natural log of 0 0.0085 molarity per second, all that divided by 0 0.0339 molarity per second, divided by 0 0.3 molar, divided by 0 0.60 molar. I want you to take note of one thing. The units cancel when we do this. And that's because when you take uh, any natural log or something, the number has to be inside there dimensionless. There can't be any real units attached to it. All right, so when we get done and we do this math, this ends up being the natural log of 0.25. This ends up being the natural log of 0.5. And if you do that math, it comes out to like 1.996. But these are orders of reaction. They uh, can't be 1.996. It's a 2. So it equals 2, just in case that's off the screen. So what we've just done is we have found what x is. And we can now place that into our generic rate law and start turning this into the real rate law. So I go up here, and I erase, and I put my 2 right there. So I now have that piece of information if I need it. I'm going to erase and come back, and we're going to do the next one. Okay, so if you've noticed, I've highlighted trials 1 and 6. Real quickly in your mind, why did I do that? What's special about trials 1 and 6 that would make me highlight them for you? My hope is that you're looking at it and saying, hey, A has stayed the same, and so has R12, but B has changed. Therefore, this rate change, the change that occurred in the rate, was because of this change in the concentration. And that means I can find Y the coefficient y, which relates to b, right here. I can find y by using my natural log of the ratio of the rates. In this case, it'll be rate 1 divided by rate 5, or 6, I'm sorry, divided by the natural log of the uh, concentration of b2 for trial 1 divided by the concentration of b2 for trial 6. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly plug in all the numbers here, and it's just going to appear on the screen real quick, a uh, little math magic or video magic for you, and that way we can save a little bit of time. Hold on one second. So as you see, I've plugged in the uh, values from the table of data, the experimental data, and I've, I've obtained that the order for this particular uh, thing, B2, is also 2. All right, so um, I can go up into my rate law up here, and I could change that to a 2, and I'm now two-thirds of the way done with this part. So I'm going to erase real quick, and we'll go on and try the next one. Okay, with that said, um, and we've got all this ready, we now need to try to isolate R12 uh, by looking at a situation where it changes, but A and B2 don't. So I'd like you to go into the table and try that real quick. Hit pause, take a look, and see if you can find your own trials that do that. And I will pause this real quick, and uh, you can come on back and tell me what you've got. Well, or tell yourself. So I chose trials 2 and 5 because, as you look at there, we have um, there's a change in the concentration of our uh, substance B2, and there's no change in our substances A and B2. I'm sorry, there's a change in our substance R12. And then this change in concentration causes whatever happens here. If you look carefully, you can see right away that changing the concentration of this catalyst did not change the rate. We got the same exact rate. That should scream to you that it's zero order, because zero order means that this substance does not affect how fast the reaction occurs. Okay, Its concentration does not affect, I should say. Um, and you might be thinking, well, it's a catalyst. It's supposed to speed up the reaction. So let me draw a line here and kind of separate things out for you. 
Here's the reaction, just like in trials two and five, but without any of their catalyst. Notice that this reaction now takes 10 to the minus seventh seconds, or that's the rate. It's very, very slow. The molarity per second is very, very slow, while up here it's 10 to the minus two. So the catalyst is necessary. It's just how much of it that you have is not. You just have, ha you just have to have enough of their catalyst available for the reaction to use it. It doesn't have to have a lot of the catalyst. And that's kind of an esoteric thing, and I brought that up on purpose in this, in this particular problem. All right, that said, what I'd like, to, like you to do is I'd like you to prove that this is zero order by using the z is equal to and then the ratio of the rates. Give that a try real quick, and then I'll flash up here my answer. So as you see from the uh, work I've put down here, when we, get up to the, when we get to the very end of this, we end up with this natural log of 1 because the rates are the same. So the natural log of 1 is 0, and therefore our order with respect to R12, uh, or R-12, whatever it's called, that stuff is 0. So what you could do is you could write a 0 in here, but putting a 0 there doesn't help us. Uh, it's not worth writing R12 in there because anything raised to the 0 is 1. Therefore, I would have written for my final rate law, and put this on the test, rate is equal to, I would have written rate is equal to K times the substance A squared times the substance B2 squared, and then I would circle it. Therefore, I know that that's your rate law. So the only thing left is for us to find the rate constant. So I'm going to stop real quick and erase, and then we'll go from there. Okay, well, we want to find the rate law or the rate constant, I'm sorry, and what we have is a rate law, which is rate is equal to k times a squared and then the substance b2 squared. Well, we can solve for the rate law by just rearranging this and saying that k is equal to the rate divided by the concentration of a squared and the concentration of b2 uh, also squared. And then we can just choose any trial. Choose any one of them. Not trial 8, though, because it did not include the catalyst. And this rate law involves the catalyst. All right. So we can choose any trial. I'm going to choose trial uh, 1 just because I can. And the rate there is 0 0.0368 molarity per second. And then I have uh, 0.5 molar. And I have to remember to square it. Then I have... 1.5 molar, and again, I have to square it. And when I do this, I end up with um, 6.54 times 10 to the minus second, or 0 0.0654. And now we have to put units on this. Always put units on. And if we look, this, mol this, this numerator, let's take this thing, this ends up being molarity divided by seconds divided by molarity squared and molarity squared, so that's molarity to the fourth. So I end up with molarity to the minus third and seconds to the minus one, because this will cancel, making that a three. So my units on this are molarity to the minus three, seconds to the minus one. I would circle that because that's my rate law. And I've now completed determining everything I need to know about this reaction, the rate law that is, in terms of this temperature. If I change the temperature, this value right here can change. The good news is the rate law does not. So there you have it. A big, long, worked out example on finding the rate law for a, a reaction based upon the method of initial rates. Uh, and this is something that you're surely going to see on your exam. So uh, please take your time and go through this and, and learn how to do this problem. Thank you.